I'm your host, Doreen Steenland, and today I'd like to welcome our guest, Erica Straub. Let's just dive right in. Um, why do you say anxiety is a symptom of trauma? Yeah, so I find a lot of times we try to just um, work with anxiety, but if we don't know what's actually happening below it, then we're kind of just managing this symptom. And to me, anxiety is a lot about the body kind of signaling to you that you don't feel safe mm -hmm. or you're out of alignment. And it's really a fear-based response. And so if we look at trauma, trauma is stored in the body and it's stored as fear. Mm -hmm. So we have to really get below the anxiety and look at, okay, why is fear circulating through my body? Where did this fear come from? What is this fear trying to reveal to me? Oh, so good. Yes. Um, oftentimes, that is exactly what we do. We try and take a symptom that we're experiencing. And, and we know this as medical professionals too, right? People do this all the time. They have pain in their elbow and they take Tylenol, but they don't explore why the pain is there, right? The pain is trying to tell you something. And what you're saying is the anxiety is doing the same. It's trying to send you a message. Am I correct? Yeah, definitely. And that's a great mm -hmm. analogy. And if we if we look at just a symptom in the body, like your elbow hurting, yeah. usually the elbow is not the problem. It's maybe yes. from the shoulder or the wrist, right? It's it's what's kind of surrounding it. And I find it's the same with anxiety and depression. I know we're going to focus more on the anxious mm -hmm. side of things today. Yeah. But yeah, those are just the the symptoms closer to the surface. And yeah. I think anxiety symptoms are so uncomfortable and so obvious. We get really stuck focusing on that as opposed to being able to discover like what's below this? Where is this coming from? What is my body trying to tell me? Yeah. And so what do you think keeps us from being curious about going deeper and exploring from yeah. your experience? That's such a great question. And I know I was stuck in that loop for a yeah. long time that I was just, how do I band-aid this anxiety and just get rid of it? I think the symptoms are so overwhelming and so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also some shame involved yes. there. Yes. So that really keeps us stuck kind of hiding the anxiety or trying to contain it. Yes. So then we don't ever give ourselves even the permission to look below it because we're also experiencing shame from this symptom. And if we bring that into the workplace, I think even more shame comes up because we're feeling anxious and, at, and we're at work and that feels maybe not appropriate or not okay or what's wrong with me. So then we're really in a spiral. So, so good. I mean, I, I know from my own personal experience, I had this anxious hum flowing right through my veins all the time. And I felt like my, my body was an engine of the car that was like <laughs> all the time, like this energy um, that is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so I turned to all kinds of things to stuff that those feelings and numb them. One being alcohol, scrolling, shopping, like all of the things we go to yeah, to stop the, the feeling that we're experiencing. Yeah, And I want to say that none of them work. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And I've also been there <laughs> from experience. They do not work. Yeah. Maybe, maybe temporarily, for yes. that moment, but long-term, um, we're not actually changing our nervous system. And that's such a great description. This like hum, yeah. that is really what it feels like this, like below the surface, um, revving, like yeah. your system is just revving. And I can imagine, I don't work in the medical profession in the same way that you have, but with that revving happening and then being kind of in a stressful environment or dealing with people who are under a lot of stress, it's really hard to be able to regulate our nervous system and change that baseline anxiety in those environments when we're also kind of taking in other people's stress and fear and anxiety with what they're going through. Oh, you said so many things that are important there that I want to highlight for, for our viewers, because, you know, as medical professionals, we could be in the middle of a code 
where your patient is crashing and we are reviving them. And then we walk out of that room and we have to go to another patient who is in their own threat mode, right? And so all of that energy is being carried with us mm -hmm. wherever we go. And the way our brains work, right, is that there's these emotional contagion, these mirror neurons that like mimic what, what we have experienced. So if we don't have time to slow that system down and learn how to self-regulate, uh, we're dragging all of that through our day and it builds and builds and builds. Yeah, that I can imagine by the end of the day in that kind of environment, just how much tension and stress and fear and overwhelm and exhaustion the body is actually carrying. Yeah. And, and that's just from, you know, like me, our medical professionals are with people in some of their most difficult hours, right? You know, you're finding out difficult disease, uh, life-threatening diseases, you're finding out or you're potentially losing a loved one, or, you know, you're just in a lot of bad situations that we would call bad, right? And so all of us have the same kind of nervous system that gets hyped up, right? So these people are hyped up and we are also absorbing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I I think of like two things come up for me and just really mm -hmm. thinking of this visual and this environment of what the what that's like. And I know with anxiety, and this was my experience too, mm -hmm. the more we try to contain it or compartmentalize it, the bigger that humming gets in the background. So we have to find a way to be able to really like acknowledge it and be with it despite like where we are of course we're not going to go to our patient or client and say I'm so anxious please take care of me <laughs> yes quite a role reversal there but being able to really speak to what you're experiencing is really probably going to name also what the other person's person is experiencing so finding the language to say this feels like it's really scary is that what you're feeling tell me about how you're doing mm -hmm. I think so finding some sort of language to name what's in the room. If there's fear in the room, if there's anxiety in the room, we're not making it about us, but we can use what's coming up in our body to really like get curious if that's also happening for the other person. So I think there's like a language gap that we could feel in that um, can help both people regulate actually. Brilliant, that is brilliant because I, I... As soon as you said that, I'm thinking of Dr. Daniel Siegel, that we have to name it to tame it, right? So whatever emotion we're feeling, we need to be able to put a label on it in order to, to let it pass through, to, to calm it down, to regulate. And when we don't, like you said, by just pretending and stuffing and compartmentalizing, it leads us to our next question, which is, why is trauma stored in the body? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's a big question. So yeah. let me try to do it some justice. I might not yeah. be able to capture okay. all of it. Um, but it gets stored in our body because when something really terrifying happens, our body goes into a survival state of fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. If we can't expel that survival energy, if we can't move through that survival energy, it gets trapped and almost frozen inside of our body. And we do that as a protective measure because sometimes these moments are so overwhelming. We go into survival states because it's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So while our body might go into the survival state and that makes sense, we have to really address what happens afterwards. Trauma isn't so much about what happens, but what happens inside of you and mm -hmm. what happens after. So the support we get after we've been through any kind of trauma makes the biggest difference. We need a safe place where we can expel everything that got like contained and suppressed in our body when something so terrifying or painful happened. Yes. So good. So it's, it's 
stays stuck in our body if we don't have a, a vehicle to move it out. You yeah. know, we need, we need that almost like that truck, that dump truck to get it out of our bodies and have somebody that we could talk to about it that is compassionate mm -hmm. and understanding, right? Like we don't want somebody who's going to say, suck it up, buttercup, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's, that's not going to cut it, right? That's not going to help us. Um, but we have to have somebody who's compassionate. And I just want to say, according to what you said, I think many of us are living in a chronic survival mode. So that your trauma might not be some big, horrific situation. It might be that you are in a chronically stressful uh, career and maybe you don't have um, the equipment you need. You don't have the staff that you need. You don't have the support that you need. You don't have community with you, right? All of those things contribute to to trauma responses, even though they're not big T trauma, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's important for us to look at, have I gone through one singular event that was so pivotal and like really impacted me? Or has there been a lot of micro moments of it and a lot of that like piling up on top of each other? Because how we work with it would be a little, a little bit different um, because those are so different in the body, yes. right? With the, the big trauma, we're really looking at moving, like connecting with the body again is a big piece. We're looking at kind of moving that out of the system. We're looking at being able to process that one event. The mm -hmm. micro traumas though, there's a lot of lifestyle changes that has to come with that. A lot of environmental changes, a lot of boundaries we have to set like with ourselves and others. So I think the pathway out of those two look a little bit different. So good. So I, I want to if maybe we can expand on that a little bit, because you said so many good things there. I don't want our uh, people to miss this. You talked about the big T trauma, basically, right? The, the big lifestyle events and learning to feel your body again. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Yeah. A lot of times um, like a big traumatic event, is so intense, it takes us out of our body. Mm -hmm. I think most of us, you know, if we've gone through something significant, um, we kind of split between our body and our mind and we live very much from like the neck up. So we're very much in our head. And that's where we go when we're in survival mode because our brain is all about safety. So we're like overthinking, we're ruminating, we're worried. There's a lot of dread and anticipation. Like if we just step back and witness our thoughts, they're all fear-based, right? And the inner monologue is very similar when we're in fear. Yes. We'll notice the same kind of thoughts or same themes repeating themselves, but we're not feeling anything in our body. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to like drop deeper into our body and into our skin so that we're not just circulating in these fear-based thoughts and revving our body up and thinking more fear-based thoughts. Like that just keeps us in this survival loop. Yes. Oh, I'm having another visual. As you're bringing up all of these visuals, I'm usually not this <laughs> visual, but I'm thinking of this hamster wheel, right? Where we're just going round and round and round um, with the same fearful thoughts over and over again, that rumination. And um, as, as you talked about experiencing your body again, We've spent a lot of time in this summit talking to somatic experts like yourself and really learning how to experience our body, process what we're storing in our bodies and um, moving through our experiences. And, and why is this such an important topic for, for our healthcare professionals and all people is because I, I think the last statistics I saw is that 50% of all females have been, have had some kind of sexual trauma in their lifetime. That's a lot of women out there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a lot of big T trauma. 
So if you or one of your colleagues or somebody that you know um, has experienced something like this, this is all stored in our bodies, mm -hmm. which yeah. is why we have to address it. Like we can't keep pushing it down. It won't stay down forever. It's like that beach ball under the water, right? You push it down for a little while and it pops back up. <laughs> Yeah, that is a great visual. That That is what trauma that's being stored in your body feels like. Yeah. And I think at some point your nervous system hits capacity for how much it can store. And then all of a sudden that beach ball is exploding. Uh, we're more highly sensitive to triggers if there's so much still that's like under the surface, like little things will start to like penetrate that trauma and it's going to start to flare up over and over again until we actually can like slow down and be with what's going on in our body. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when we've had trauma, there's two pathways we go in. Mm -hmm. We either start to under function mm -hmm. or we start to over function, which I imagine the over functioning really shows up in the medical profession yes. and frontline workers because it is so high paced. So some of that also is protective because the faster we go and the more chaos there is externally, we don't have to address really what's going on internally until our nervous system and our body says, no more, I can't do this. I'm burnt out. I'm done. I'm having panic attacks. Yeah. So we'll know when we hit that line. And I think so much of the work is making a choice before that happens, making a choice to slow down. Oh, you're not kidding. Um, because when we wait so we get to that point. It's the work is so much more difficult and the patterns are so much harder to break. And I love what you said about the over and under because it's funny that's that's the, that's some of the terminology that I use. Like the over and under are the symptoms, right? They're the symptoms that we have. We're overdoing something or underdoing something. They're the symptoms of what's really going on inside. And um I attribute it, and maybe you don't attribute it to this, but I attribute it to like overeating, over drinking, over scrolling, you know, under under uh, connecting, right? All of those things that come from from trauma. Um, so let's talk about the survival states of the nervous system, if you can. Maybe yes. that will give us more clarity. Yeah, I'll just give like a a brief little synopsis of the the main three that we go into mm -hmm. um, I also like to use the reference of polyvagal which yes. I'm not sure if the viewers are familiar with but basically it's just talking about the nervous system and the vagus nerve mm -hmm. and if you look at the survival states um, in in the visual of like a ladder we have at the top um, fight and flight Mm -hmm. So this is our sympathetic, this is our move away from danger. So flight would look like running away, pretty self-explanatory with yeah. the labeling of it, but it's really mm -hmm. like, I need to get away from this. Um, I can't fight this, right? It's too big. So my option is to like move away, run away, get away. Okay. And stop right there because I want to say, what are some ways people run away? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think a really big one to name is just distractions. Yes. Right? Like <laughs> Netflix binges, right? Food. I think addictions actually are one of the biggest symptoms that we're in flight and running away from something. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. It was <laughs> just right there. Go ahead. Not at all. That was the top of the ladder. Okay. Let's go back. Usually flight is our first choice. Then usually we move into fight, which is also sympathetic but it's more aggressive, right? We're going to stand and fight whatever's in front of us. So it's very, um, there's a lot of charge to it and it's more explosive. And there's also a belief that I'm bigger than whatever this thing is so I can fight it. Where in mm -hmm. flight mode, the difference is, I don't think I'm big enough to fight this. So I need to get away. Mm -hmm. so and fight good. mode, you know, can be physical, verbal, you yes. name it. Yeah. but it's like more inflammatory. This yeah. And then the deepest survival response is freeze, which is a combination of all that sympathetic energy is still there, but we contain it. So the gas and the brake are slammed down at the same time. Mm -hmm. you feel this huge charge, but you don't feel like you can get away. 
and you don't feel like you can fight it. So there's this real shutdown that happens and you it truly get frozen and stuck. So good. Yeah. So, so that's like that deer in headlights mm -hmm. response yeah. or the possum that plays dead, right? That's like, we just lay down, we get under the covers and we're like, I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to sleep or I'm just going to check out or I'm going to, I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I don't it, know it, what, it, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of confusion in that state. We don't know what to do. We feel trapped, stuck, immobile. Yes. Really. And um, I would imagine what would be really helpful for frontline workers is to really be able to identify these three states within themselves, mm -hmm. but also to be able to identify them in their patients. Because Ooh. if we know you know, if our patients are in one of these states, how we show up for them will look a bit different. Someone in flight mode is going to be a lot different than someone who's frozen. Yes. Oh, that's such a good application. I love what you just said, because it takes it. Yes, we want to focus on what's happening in us, but it also takes it to the bedside. Mm -hmm. Your patients are going through this too. Your, your students, if you're a school teacher, your students have these patterns as well, right? So we need to be looking for these in other people. And, and so maybe you can tell us like when we see it in somebody else, how might we help them? Yeah, such a great question. Um, if we're looking at someone in flight, they're probably going to be the person that's um, presenting more anxious. So there's a lot of fidgeting, you know, a lot of fast movement, their speech is really quick. Maybe they're not really connecting with you because mm -hmm. they're so overwhelmed. So for me, if I see that when I'm working with clients and it's a little, a little different than in the medical setting, but if I'm working with a client in that mode, mm -hmm. what I'm tracking is, wow, there's a lot of like excess energy here. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to be able to get into like the deeper stuff or really connect until we move this like buzz that's there. So I like to come to movement. If I see a client really kind of moving and shaking and all that, I invite it. Let's let's get up and stand. Let's like shake the body out. Let's take a couple of minutes to like be in movement. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's pacing, maybe that's deep breaths, but anything to help kind of move that energy so we can create some settling after. Mm -hmm. If I see someone um, who's frozen, they're going to look like really contained and really stuck the deer and headlights look. Yeah. So I would invite gentle movement in instead. Like, can we just like move the fingers a little bit? Can we move the toes a little bit? Can you release your neck a little bit? Mm -hmm. Like really gentle movement. That's going to help them like slowly come back online. Yeah. So I always go to movement okay. first because that connects us to the body and yeah. takes a lot of the stories that are playing out. So good. And this is something that we can all do mm -hmm. um, with ourselves, with our clients, with our kids, mm -hmm. with our family members, right? Yep. Yep. Hey, awesome. things, things are getting tense right now. You, maybe your husband's coming home and he's angry, right? And he's in that, that uh, aggressive mode because he's had a bad day mm -hmm. and so can we just take five minutes and, or a few minutes and just move our bodies a little bit let's do some stretches let's talk this through let's um take some deep breaths right getting that vagus nerve activated in your in the stomach by deep belly breaths can really slow us down a little bit right because that's the revved up yeah, uh, energy that you're talking about. So we want to kind of do the opposite, right? Yes and no. I okay. like to think of it as I like to match the energy that's being presented first. Because if I'm super anxious, right, and I'm I'm moving around and someone says, "Be still, meditate." <laughs> yeah. be like, no way, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's too much of a gap. Yeah. So I like to kind of meet the energy where it's at and then just like slowly invite it back to regulation and settledness. Wow, that was a huge nugget there, guys. Okay, what Erica just said is we need to take baby steps. We can't go extreme, right? It has to be a baby step. We need to come closer to them and bring them one step further away from that anxiety, one step at a time. 
Yeah. I, and I love the analogy of like our nervous system isn't a light switch. It's more of a dimmer. So yeah. we can go from like high anxiety to just totally at peace. Yeah. It's going to have little gradual increments taking us there. So to really oh. trust that process, right? That it's not going to be a, a quick, just state shift like that. We have to like, let it be really slow and gradual. Oh, that is so good. All right. Well, I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but I want to be uh, faithful to our viewers time, time. And so do you have any last minute tips that you want to leave with our viewers or any last parting words uh, before we break away? Yeah, I think I would just say if, if we can start to identify anxiety and mm -hmm. detangle fear from like when we're feeling anxiety, then we can actually work with it and move with it and let it let it be a guide. But I think as long as anxiety and fear are so entangled, we get so spun by the anxiety symptoms. So that that would just be my offering to start with like, how can I separate fear from anxiety? Just because I'm feeling anxiety doesn't mean that something's like wrong with me or anything like that, but it means I need to listen. Yes right back to where we started, back to listening to what the body is telling you. I love it.